Okay, so uh, shall we uh, carry on? So um, I was intending to finish this uh, uh, sutta, we're just having a look at the last uh, remaining defilements of the mind uh, to be overcome, and uh, then uh, come to the very end of the whole path as a consequence. So let's carry on with these defilements. We just had a look at the idea of uh, discomfort, uh, yeah, just now, uh, and uh, it also uh, kind of also reminds us of the importance of being comfortable uh, in meditation practice. Yeah, how important it is to set yourself up in a way where you can be at ease and you can really relax. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, because these things become obstacles for the meditation. So once you decide that you're not, you're going to overcome all of these things, then while meditating, excessive energy arose in me. Uh, and because of that, my immersion, my samadhi, fell away. Uh. When the immersion falls away, the light and vision of form, forms vanish. Uh. So excessive energy. Uh. And this is when you are uh, basically trying too hard, usually. It's usually what this is referring to. Uh. So the mind is kind of... Uh, uh, still working a little bit too much, uh, and it is a kind of restlessness really, it comes under the idea of restlessness. Uh, and what you have to do in these kind of situations is you have to learn to be more passive, uh, just to sit back, just to enjoy the uh, powerful experiences, uh, and not do anything about it, uh, and be passive. And most of us can relate to this, this is not just for deep meditation experiences, uh, but this problem also is very common for everyone, really. Yeah, you're doing too much in your meditation. You don't have the ability to just sit back and enjoy her. So the idea of learning just to sit back, yeah, the idea of resting after a long day's work and all of these kind of ideas, uh, they help us with the idea of just being aware, being pass passive. Uh, being a passenger on the train is a really nice way of thinking about it. Yeah. If you're sitting on the train, you're looking out through the window, uh, you are not shouting to the driver what to do, you're just sitting there watching passively. Whatever happens outside of the window, you take it in, but you have no choice in what you are experiencing. Yeah, the, uh, uh, Whatever is there, whatever is outside the window, you, have no, you just have to accept that as it is. Uh, in the same way, you learn this idea of passivity in meditation practice, not doing it, but enjoying it. And this kind of reduces the excessive energy uh, as you, as you do that. Suppose a person was, in the, was to grip a quail too tightly in their hands. Yeah, it would die right there. So you are killing off your meditation if you grip it too hard. You don't want to grip your meditation with your mind. You want to allow that quail, that mind, to kind of uh, develop on, by itself without you trying to uh, make it happen, so to speak. Yeah. I'll make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor fear, nor excitement, nor discomfort, nor excessive energy will arise in me again. Then while meditating, overly lax energy arose in me. And because of that, my immersion fell away. So uh, in meditation practice, uh, there is, of course, there is, we need to have energy, you need to have the energy of the mind. And even if you don't do very much, the mind needs to be energized. Uh, and if there, uh, the lack of energy in the mind is very similar to the idea of dullness and drowsiness. Uh, and so what you do when you have lacks in energy, you try to bring up an inspiring contemplation in the mind. Uh, and I've been talking about this a little bit, not too much, uh, but uh, the idea of being inspired is the idea of feeling uh, interested, yeah, of feeling that this is really worthwhile. Uh, and a very important part of the inspiration, and the Buddha talks about inspiration in a number of ways. Uh, one of the words in Pali that be, can be translated as inspiration is Veda. Veda means on the one hand to know something, uh, on the other hand to feel and experience something. Uh, and inspiration is very similar because when you are inspired, you understand, you know, wow, this is really good stuff, yeah? You know it's good, and you also feel a sense of emotional pull at the same time, yeah? Inspiration is also emotion at the same time. Yeah? Very similar to the idea of Veda in the suttas. Yeah? 
And that Veda arises, can arise by contemplating the Dhamma, feeling inspired by Dhamma discourse. It can be because of the contemplating the Sangha, the Sangha means the noble, the Aryans, the noble ones, feeling inspired by someone who you feel really has the act together, yeah, some, uh, wherever that might be. It can be inspired by the Buddha, yeah, of course, even though the Buddha is a bit distant, but the inspiration in the Buddha is also part of that. But also things like understanding your sila. Sila means that the uh, recollection of your conduct actually is an important part of this. Uh, recollection of your generosity is an important part of this. Sometimes you just think about your life. Yeah, and in meditation you have to be very gentle with yourself when you do these kind of things. Uh, you don't want to do a lot of heavy thinking which destroys the peace and calm that you have. Uh, what you do is, what I usually like to say, you nudge the mind in a certain direction. Uh, yeah, very gently remind yourself of something you have done. A beautiful act of kindness, an act of generosity, when you really felt something in the past. You felt uplifted by your own conduct. And that very uplift that you felt at that time, you bring it into the present. And when you bring it into the present, you regain some of that emotional experience that you had at some point in the past. Energy comes back, the mind feels inspired. You bring that energy in with the breath or whatever it is that you're doing and the whole experience becomes much more interesting and powerful as a consequence. Yeah, energy, bringing energy into the meditation practice. When immersion falls away, the light and vision of forms vanish. Suppose a person was to grip a quail too loosely, it would fly out of the hands. So you need a bit of that energy, a little bit of holding on. So a little bit of effort seems to be implied here as well, in fact. I'll make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor fear, nor excitement, nor discomfort, nor excessive energy, nor overly lax energy will arise in me again. While meditating, longing arose in me here. Yeah, longing, abhijapa, uh, not entirely sure what that word means, a very rare word in the suttas. Uh, so maybe longing is right, I think it's just an alternative word for desire really. So here you have the first of the five hindrances. Uh, we have seen pretty much all the other ones, uh, but here's the first one. And uh, it is something to do with desire. Uh, and uh, desire can, of course, have the form of longing. Yeah, you long for something. You long for uh, uh, whatever it is. There's something missing in your life, and you feel that you have that longing for that thing that is missing. Yeah. And uh, this can, of course, arise in uh, in anyone at any time. It's just a form of desire, really, a form of attachment that you have. Uh, um, so maybe you have a memory of your. Uh, uh, someone very dear to you who has passed away, and then the longing uh, to be with that person, for example, arises in you. Yeah? Longing is often related to people. Uh, you long for someone who has passed away, whoever that might be. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, destructive for the meditation practice. Uh, and uh, so then you focus on the joy and happiness that you are requiring in your meditation, and you realize that that longing probably is misplaced. Uh, I'll make sure that none of these things uh, arise in my mind, uh, yeah? But while meditating, perception of diversity arose in me. Yeah? So the uh, point of uh, samadhi is to unify the mind, <coughs> to have a simple object, one light in the mind, uh, one form in the mind, uh, one thing that you focus on. Uh, and the more you're focused in on, on a single object, uh, the more unified the mind is, uh, and the more samadhi you have as a consequence. Uh. But sometimes the perception that you have can be a perception of maybe you have many lights coming at one go, yeah? Many lights is not so good. One light is far better. Uh. So perception of diversity would be then many things happening in the mind. Uh. And uh, remember, sometimes you hear people saying that even in a jhana state you can have like sense experience, like sounds or whatever. Huh? But if you have sense experience in the jhana state, uh, sense experience by definition is diversity. Huh? When you're seeing right now, you're seeing enormous amount of things at the same time, that's called diversity. Huh? When you hear the sound is always changing, that's called diversity. Huh? So here we are doing the opposite of diversity, we're unifying the mind. Huh? 
So this shows that even here, you want to avoid the perception of the senses, even at this point. And this is prior to the jhanas already. This is before the jhanas, right? We're talking about now. Huh? And so diversity is a problem if we want to unify the mind pro pro properly. Huh? So you go back to a single object and you make that the main attention. That's why we start with the breath. The breath then turns into the, uh, 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 turned into the light and the form, and then we carry on from there. Yeah. So you make sure that none of these things happening. Yeah. And while meditating, uh, uh, heedful, keen and diligent, uh, I perceived both lights and visions of form, but before long my light and vision of forms vanished. Uh, it occurred to me, what's the cause, what's the reason why my light and vision of forms vanish? Uh, it occurred to me excessive concentration on forms arose in me. Uh, and because of that, my immersion fell away. When immersion falls away, the light and vision of forms fall away. Excessive concentration on forms. I'm not entirely sure what the, exactly what this means, but uh, the Pali here, Atti Nijaya Tattang, uh, has, is somehow related to the idea of like staring or kind of excessive uh, looking almost, uh, and maybe you are again uh, trying too hard to kind of look at the form or look at what's going on and kind of just staring too much or whatever, however you want to call it. Uh, maybe putting in a little bit too much effort perhaps, uh, uh, maybe just focusing on the form rather than the light. Uh, and the form is something that you have to give up eventually because the form will be transformed when you enter a deep samadhi state. Uh, so you have to leave the form behind to some extent down the track yeah, and just enter into a pure kind of uh, formless jhana state. Uh, so not entirely sure what that means, but the idea I think is that the rupa has to go at some point uh, and uh, you kind of uh, leave that behind. Uh. Anyway, so there you are. There's a long list of upakilesas for you. And some of those are going to be relevant for you right now because they are true for anyone who tries to follow the breath or do any kind of meditation, some of these things will be far more relevant down the track when you come to this particular samadhi. So, so uh, it is all there for you to uh, uh, reflect on, but uh, coming back to uh, the basic idea of upakalesa, the five hindrances is essentially what we are looking at. That's the main thing. So you can focus on the five hindrances as the main idea or the main um, fo focus for understanding what these defilements are about. Okay, so let's look fairly quickly at the rest of the suit. I'm not going to go into great detail now because uh, it's getting late and we don't need to look at these things in great detail because they are very profound things, but they are interesting nevertheless. Uh, I'll make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor terror, nor excitement, nor discomfort, nor excessive energy, nor over relaxed energy, nor longing, nor perception of diversity, nor excessive concentration on forms will arise in me. When I understood that, that doubt is a corruption of the mind, this is the Upakalesa, I gave it up. So this is kind of the um, thing here. The thing is to have that insight into the nature of the mind, to understand the corruptions of the mind. And this is what we do. Uh, this is a very important part of the Satipatthana practice. Uh, if you remember the Satipatthana Sutta at the very end, it's all about contemplation of the five hindrances. Uh, this part of the last part of Satipatthana called Dhamma Nupassana, contemplation of uh, mental qualities or contemplation of principles, uh, is actually understanding the five hindrances. And this is exactly what we're seeing here. But here we're seeing it from the viewpoint of uh, this large number of upakilesas instead, refined, refined defilements of the mind. But it's the same idea. You want to investigate th these things, uh, you want to understand that they are problematic, and when you see that they are problematic, then you use your um, practice to overcome these things and you leave them behind. Uh, and this is what the Buddha-to-be is doing here. Huh? And it's a similar thing for any kind of meditator really. Huh? When I understood that loss of focus, dullness and drowsiness, fear, excitement, discomfort, excessive energy, overly lax energy, longing, perception of diversity, and excessive concentration 
on forms are corruptions of the mind, I gave them up. While meditating, heedful, keen and diligent, I perceived light, but I did not see forms. I saw forms, but did not see light. And this went on for a whole night, a whole day, even a whole night and day. I thought, what is the cause, what is the reason for this? It occurred, to, it occurred to me, when I don't focus on the basis or foundation of the forms, but focus on the foundation of the light, then I perceive light and do not see forms. But when I don't focus on the foundation for light, but focus on the foundation of the forms, then I see forms and do not perceive light. And this goes on for a whole night and a whole day, even a whole night and day. So, um, uh, the uh, Buddha-to-be is uh, basically looking at uh, various qualities of the meditation. Yeah, sometimes the form may fall away and all that is left is a brightness in the mind. And uh, that is probably not the best way to go forward because it's more difficult to focus on. Ideally, you want both the form and the light. If you have just the form then, but not the light, uh, then you are missing some of the energy that is required in the meditation. You want these things to come together. There's, that's why uh, I think he is looking into what these things actually mean so he can get the right balance in the mind, the energy, the ability to focus and all of these things. Uh, it goes on for a whole night, a whole day, even a whole night and day. Uh, so it carries on for a long time, but ultimately the idea you want to go beyond this, not just staying with this, but you want to go even further. Huh? While meditating diligent or heedful, keen and diligent, I perceive limited light and so limited forms. I perceive, li I perceive limitless light and limitless forms. And this went on for a whole night and a whole day, even a whole night and day. I thought, what is the cause, what is the reason for this? It occurred to me, when my samadhi, my immersion is limited, then my vision is limited. And with limited vision, I perceive limited light and see limited forms. But when my immersion samadhi is limitless, then my vision is limitless. And my limitless vision, I perceive limitless light and limited less forms. So again, the Buddha-to-be is looking to purify the samadhi. He wants things to be limitless. Yeah? He wants to understand the whole process of these things. Uh, and so he uh, is moving towards the limitless visions here. And this goes on for a whole night and a whole day, even a whole night and day. Yeah? After understanding that doubt, loss of focus, dullness and drowsiness, fear, excitement, discomfort, excessive energy, over-relaxed energy, longing, perception of diversity, and excessive concentration on forms are corruptions of the mind, I had given them up. I thought, uh, I've given up my mental corruptions. Now let me develop samadhi in three ways. I developed samadhi while placing the mind and keeping it connected, uh, without placing the mind but just keeping it connected. Uh, without placing the mind or keeping it connected, uh, with rapture, without rapture, with pleasure and with equanimity. Yeah. Uh, three, I'm not sure about the three ways, there seems to be more than three ways there, but anyway. Well <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, now the Buddha to be, what he is doing now, he has kind of purified, he has understood uh, all the lower aspects of samadhi. Uh, he has contemplated the limitless samadhi, the limited samadhi, the various corruptions of the mind, abandoned all of that. Uh, and now he wants to go beyond all of this. Yeah? Remember he had this recollection when he was a child, uh, the recollection of the first jhana experience. Uh, while his father was working in the fields, he had this automatic experience, and now this is where he wants to go. He wants to experience the full immersion of the mind, the full samadhi of the mind. Uh, and here we have an, a, a slightly different way of classifying samadhi. Usually the jhanas are classified as fourfold, but this is actually a fivefold classification of the jhanas. Uh, yeah, it's called threefold, but it's really a, a fivefold classification. And the, the 
first jhana uh, is uh, divided into two subcategories, uh, yeah? Or there is one kind of intermediate category be between the first and the second jhana. And this is why this looks slightly different from uh, the usual ideas. So you develop immersion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Uh, and placing the mind and keeping it connected, these are translations for vitaka and vichara, which usually are rendered as a thought. But because we are talking about the deep stillness of the mind, uh, we at least have a different meaning when it comes to the jhana states. Uh, and they are just a very gentle kind of movement of the mind that we're looking at here. Uh, and it's already gone beyond your ability to will anything. This is an automatic process happening in the mind itself. Uh, and this is, this is the uh, hallmark of the first jhana, that it has this wobble, as Ajahn Brahm calls it. Uh, yeah, this is the wobble of the first jhana. In the second jhana, uh, you have the, uh, there is no vitaka anymore, it's avitaka, without placing the mind, uh, and merely keeping it connected, which is vichara here. Uh, it's just a slight holding on to the object, uh, but basically that is all that is left. Uh, and then you come to the second jhana, which is ataka, avitaka, avichara down here. Uh, and this is where all vitaka and vichara is left behind, and you actually attain the full samadhi for the first time. Full samadhi means complete unity of the mind, where the mind is completely immersed in itself. Uh, there is no movement, there is nothing happening, it's complete stillness. Uh, the first time in your life that you have experienced anything like this. Uh, then uh, you have samadhi that is uh, sapitakang, where there is a uh, rapture, and then you have samadhi without rapture, where all there is is bliss. Uh, and then you have samadhi which is uh, uh, sata sahagatang, this is another word for sukha, there is uh, bliss in the mind. Uh, yeah. And then you have the last one, which is the Upeka Sahagatang Samadhi here. So these are just different ways of talking about the jhana states that are found in this particular sutta. And the very last one here, the Upeka Sahagatang, this is the fourth jhana where you have the pure equanimity that is left behind. The Sata Sahagatang is the third jhana where you have happiness, the bliss in the meditation. And then you have the uh, Sapitakang, which is usually the second jhana and also the first jhana. You can see the various kind of jhanas here. Yeah. So it's all very exciting and all very profound. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, you're coming now towards the very, very end of the Buddhist path. Yeah? The Buddha to be is now getting incredibly close to awakening after all this hard work, uh, leaving behind, contemplating all of these upakilesas, uh, trying to purify the mind to the maximum. Uh, now he's getting extremely close to be able to break through. Uh, this idea, upeka sagatang, the word upeka really means to look on. And for the first time in your life, you have the pure ability to just look on at what is happening here. Uh, before this, the mind has still has some kind of bias to some extent, uh, but the fourth jhana is, is supposed to be anenja, it is imperturbable. Uh, it has the ability to withstand any kind of shock. Uh, why? Because it is very, very strong at this particular point. And that is why the fourth jhana is the foundation for insight, always in Buddhism. The most powerful foundation for insight. Uh, so now, insight can happen here. So what happens next? Uh, when I had developed immersion in these ways, uh, the knowledge and vision arose in me. Uh, yeah? Uh, my freedom is unshakable. Uh, this is my last rebirth that now there is no more future lives. And uh, this is kind of fascinating because what you will notice here is that uh, there is nothing here about the usual things about remembering your past lives, understanding the laws of Kamma and becoming an Arahant, which is the usual Vidja that comes at the very end of the path. All that is left out. It goes straight from the Jhana states, straight to becoming an Arahant. That's kind of fascinating here. Yeah? Why does that happen? And the reason why it happens is because if you practice these jhanas in this way, uh, they are so powerful that the vision, the insight that comes automatically from these particular states, uh, you're so close to awakening already that you can no longer stop the mind from going there. Uh, knowledge and vision arises. Uh, you reach the unshakable deliverance of the mind. Yeah? 
the Buddha knows this is my last birth. I have achieved what I set out to achieving, found the end of dukkha. Now, finally, he has become the Buddha, yeah, because now he has the insight of the Buddha at this particular point. So this is what is happening here. So if you want to practice as the Buddha and you want to follow in his footsteps, this is what you have to do. Your freedom has to become unshakable. This is your last birth. Now there is no more future lives. This is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, Venerable Anuruddha was happy with what the Buddha said. Upakilesa Suttang Nikti Tang Attamang the end of the Upakilesa Sutta. So, uh, there you are. So that, that is kind of a fairly amazing uh, Sutta and very, very powerful towards the end there. Uh, and uh, perhaps you feel this is far away, perhaps this feels very alien and very dif difficult to kind of make sense of perhaps. Uh, but uh, it's nice to know what it is, what it is like, yeah, to have some idea of what this path is all about. Uh, and I have personally always enjoyed reading the suttas, understanding independent origination, understanding what the awakening experience are roughly about, because once you have that idea of the map, uh, you have the vision of the overall path, uh, then all the little aspects that we're trying to do, they fit into the larger picture. It becomes more interesting, more easy to practice in the right way when you have that bird's eye view of what actually is going on. Uh, so, uh, uh, there you are, and uh, uh, tomorrow we're going to carry on. We're going to look at some more suttas that are more related to insight and understanding, uh, and we're going to look and continue in the same kind of vein. Uh, but that is the sutta for today. So let's do a tiny bit more of meditation together, and we'll come back to the Q&A again afterwards. So.